Um, so, uh, thanks for coming to my session. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm Chris Wood. Um, I'm a freelance writer, software developer, architect, tea maker. Um, I do all sorts of different things. Um, I did used to be an API product manager. I'm not anymore. Um, if I was with the UK government, I would be minister without portfolio. Everywhere else, I'm unemployed at the moment. So, but being unemployed gives me the luxury of just picking something at random to talk about. Um, so, uh, I, the thing I talked at, I uh, picked to talk about at random was: um, Will open banking trigger the API of me? Okay. So, why am I talking about this idea? Um, so. I worked for one year at um, the Visa Europe Innovation Lab, and uh, during that time, <coughs> we tackled a, um, a theme called uh, Me to Be. Now, Me to Be is essentially a, a concept or a movement, call it what you will, of redefining the relationship between a consumer and the businesses they engage with, so that a consumer is empowered to take control of, of effectively of their wants and needs. Okay, so they will take control and actually get what they want from the organisations that they choose to do business with. Okay, so this 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 concept or theme of me to be um, spawns this idea of the API of me. So the API of me becomes the access point um, for uh, those wants and needs that I've identified, and it becomes the access point where for which those businesses I want to I want to engage with come and get the data they need in order to understand me, to understand my wants and needs, in a manner that's um, in a manner that's secure and authorised by me. So we move from this loud hailer approach that businesses take of marketing to the masses into into this secure, tailored experience. But the the API of me can't can't exist um, without the, the the data platform, let's call it, um, to back it up. So, and that 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 data platform is what's called personal data store. Okay, so let's just dive in, dive in a bit into a personal data store. What is it? Well, it it is what it says. It's a data store for your personal data. Um, it's where you aggregate your data. You start to take control of it. You offer that data up uh, in a in a tailored and curated manner, um, uh, as you see fit to the people that you want to engage with. Um, so let's just walk around some of these um, some of these some of these uh, categories or, or or classifications that you see on screen. So monetary data, obviously, that's that's your your your. your your bank account data, it might be your receipts, it might be the basket data when you do online grocery shopping, it may be your order history off Amazon, but it's stuff that describes you from a monetary level. Um, health, if such things exist, it could be your electronic health records, it could be your activity data, you know, how often you run, you know, when you get a download from your Garmin watch, whatever. Um, repeats, I call... I, I, it's just a, a word for stuff that's repeated often, anniversaries, you know, birthdays, insurance renewals, uh, whatever. Intentions. Intentions is, you know, things that you are about to do that you might be making a decision on. So, for example, your browsing history might describe products you're interested in, services you're interested in. Uh, location and transport, where you've been, what you do. Uh, social, well, that's obvious. Tweets, posts, check-ins, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, document management. So your personal data store might contain documents that are important to you. Maybe a copy of your passport. Maybe a copy of proof of address um, um, that potentially could be you know, notarized so that they, they provide a, an authentic copy of um, some proof that you need to provide to an organization that you're about to do business with. And all this kind of stuff coalesces into this idea of, you know, what are your habits? You know, what's habitual? What do you do every day that may be relevant to the businesses you want to engage with? And it could be simple stuff, you know, just like every weekday I get a coffee in this area of London and I want to find 
a loyalty scheme for ethical uh, coffee shops. Okay, maybe simple as that. It may be oh, I'm looking for insurance uh, for my pet, and and that insurance is due on this date. And but I only want providers who invest ethically. You know, so, so it's it's about it's taking those data sources. Um, understanding them and, and curating them and then using that data in order to get engaged with the businesses and, and get their products and services in a way that um, is relevant to you and, 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 and allows you to, to, to tailor the experience you get from the organisations you engage with. So th this is kind of the, 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 the classifications that go into it. In terms of like a physical thing, it can be a centralised data store where data is ingested and aggregated and stored somewhere, or it can be a, a federated model. So the data that, that currently exists out there about you, whether it's in your bank or whether it's in um, Facebook or whatever, you know, the, 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 the data store brings all this information together on the fly and, and gives you a view on your data while leaving the data at rest. Um, where it is, um, where it's um, stored at, at, at the time. So there's different approaches to actually bringing the data together. But the idea is to give you a view of the data that um, lets you make sense of, of of what you want and how you want it. So um, you know, this the, everything I put on screen there is, you know, my opinion. But let's look at somebody else's opinion. So uh, my data 2016 happened recently. And Humanada is a, is a German startup in the personal data store space, and I nabbed one of their slides in order to show that, you know, my opinion is, is also a fact being built elsewhere. So, you know, in terms of what's on screen, there's you, that's the person, that's the consumer who's taking control. Here's all the classifications, uh, basket, the bank, uh, monetary data, transport, and here's all the wider organisations that we're, we're aiming to deal with. So that personal data store is, is, is key to realising this concept of the API of me. Um, so I've kind of described this in conceptual terms, but there are real personal data stores out there in the wild. Um, a lot of them are in um, startup mode. Others are starting to come out of startup mode. But I've, it's, it's worth just running through a few examples just to give you a flavour of what they are and what they're all about. So this first one I've got on screen is uh, called Miko. Um, Miko uses a series of views um, in order to c help you curate um, your data into a way that's relevant to you. So for example, they, they, these views are called tiles, but, but for example, they, um, they let, give you starting points. Are you old, young, baby? And it doesn't have to be just you. It can be your family. You can curate any sort of view that you want and turn that into a tile and that tile tells a story about that person. Um, for example, I, I created a, a tile on my dog because the, the history of my pet is, um, is uh, the profile of my pet is relevant to me as a person. So there's a picture of my dog. Quite happy to show off more pictures of my dog after the presentation if anybody wants to see them. Um, yeah, so th that kind of gives you a flavour of this idea of curation and helping you provide profiles and personas um, via, that are going to be exposed via the API of me. Um, the next example, uh, another personal data store uh, is MyDex. Um, so they have a, a, a data store you know, um, behind, the, behind the platform that's, that's encrypted and on the cloud somewhere. But their, their focus is very much about guiding the individual into making um, connections with organisations in a way that's secure and really reveals the data that they need to. So, so for example, if you need to exchange data with local government, with energy utilities, um, uh, I think there's a third sector, I think they made third party sector. It, it, it kind of guides the individual in terms of taking that data and exposing it in a way that's meaningful but limits the exposure. But nonetheless, again, this idea of curation, helping the user understand their data and then make that available to third parties they want to interact with. Um, the final example is an uh, uh, organisation called Trunomi. Now, Trunomi interesting because they, 
they ex kind of accept the, the, the federated model. So a load of the data about you is, is somewhere, it's in the bank, it's in your insurance provider, it's somewhere else. And Trinomi actually accepts that and, and provides a framework for, for customers to be able to make that data available to other third parties from where it is. So without this kind of aggregation data ingestion feature, um, it, it, it accepts the fact that data is going to stay there for the time being. It's possibly the best place for it because of the security practices that these organizations have got in, in, um, in looking after your data. But they also accept the fact that you as an individual and as a consumer need access to that data. You need control of it. And what they provide is, a, is, a, is an application that, that, that allows you to share it via um, an API to whomever you need to see it. Um, yeah, so it effectively Trunomi works on behalf of businesses that need to, to share the data, but the focus is still very much on the, on the consumer. So, so, so this personal data store, right? In order to make it meaningful, we need to populate it with data. Yes, we can type some stuff in, but, but ultimately we need to ingest data into the personal data store and um, do stuff with it to make it meaningful to then present that data via the API of me. Can we do that? Uh, well, in some, series, <laughs> some areas, yes, we can do that. Uh, why can we do that? Because the APIs exist that allow us to access the data. An example I put up there is social platforms. So social platforms have grown up with APIs, with providing APIs. So it's only natural that a consumer accessing their data that's stored in, say, Facebook is, is a fairly trivial thing to do, you know. Um, in other areas, no. And the most pertinent one in the context of this talk is, is banking, although I'd put health out there as being one that's reasonably inaccessible. But banking is, um, or banking data is, is quite, um, is, is inside the bank's vaults, uh, and it's difficult for consumers to access account data that, um, that they need in order to build up this profile of themselves, this, this, this picture and this curated experience inside the personal data store. Um, so, so, of course, open banking is therefore important because the open banking, open banking and, and the personal data store um, means that we're actually ingesting a source of really meaningful data. You know, the, our, our account data describes various things about us, our, our purchasing decisions, um, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it, it's, it's a rich seam of data that we need to um, get into the personal data store to then understand, help us understand um, what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the idea of open banking, i.e. open APIs for banks, obviously um, obviously makes data acquisition easy, or easier, with the right authentication. Um, consumers should be able to pull data into their personal data store in order to start aggregating it and correlating it with all those other sources of data that we saw earlier on. Uh, open banking should provide the backbone for secure access to, to these data sources, whether we're pulling our data from one bank or pulling it from many. So, um, so what, you know, what, what are the prospects for open banking in the API of me? Well, I think it's fair to say that, that open banking won't really happen kind of as a pure initiative. Banks are unlikely to... to um, to create and expose um, open APIs because they think it's a great thing to do for the customer. They're only going to do it because they're going to be forced to by regulation. Now, that's not true in every case. Of course, there are, there are banking APIs out there. But um, regulation really provides the motivation for, for open banking to become a reality. Um, there's also this idea that the API management vendors will also sell the dream of open banking to a favorable CTO who's looking for a dream catcher in order to get ahead of the game for PSD2 or whatever. 
Um, and some banks will expose APIs because they make an investment in technology. But, but regulation is going to provide the impetus. And the, you know, the, the big thing over the last couple of years has been PSD2. Um, is that going to provide us a, a real open banking framework? Well, you know, if you read some of the press, the jury's out at the moment. I think you know, I was reading some articles on the, the technical standards for strong customer authentication, and it's clear that, that, that the, the current drafts actually give um, banks quite a bit of flexibility in how they implement their interfaces. And if that's the case, then actually there's going to be no, there may be few standards and it may be quite difficult to integrate across many different banks in order to actually feed the um, personal data store. Um, there's also local initiatives driving it. So um, Co Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, for example, recently um, released a draft on um, on um, open banking for the UK banking industry, and the need for um, the need for UK-based banks to provide open APIs um, for their customers. However, in the same breath, they also made the banking industry responsible for 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 coming up with the technical framework. Um, and given given the uh, years of um, banks not opening account data and uh, creating open APIs, it's possible that the, that may not act as a, enough of a um, spur to the banking industry in the UK as a whole to actually get on and get these open APIs into place. So, yes, the concept of open banking and, and the idea of the API of me, of course, open banking is valuable to the API of me, but will it materialise, given the fact it's being driven by government and regulation in the way that that it can feed the personal data store, it's hard to say, I think, at the moment. If it happens, then great. It's obviously going to be a rich seam of data that's going to feed our personal data stores. If it doesn't, then, um, then there, there has to be other ways. Um, so what are the other ways? The usual suspects, uh, screen stra scraping, um, using the APIs that are already there, manual updates, people downloading CSV files, um, aggregators, they've got the potential to be um, the de facto standard because they're, they're, they're aggregating against all these different banks in the banking landscape and, um, and actually they become the, the means for the personal data source to ingest the data. So when I talk about like, um, aggregators and APIs and uh, I always mention Figo, they're my poster boy, for, uh, poster child for uh, for 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 a really great uh, mechanism for integrating across banking, it, it might be more pain, uh, but it's it's not unachievable. So, so in summary, the API of me, this 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 exposing of our personal data in this curated experience for engaging with different businesses, it. It will happen without open banking. It will almost be slower, almost certainly be slower without it. Um, but open banking done right will definitely accelerate that, that idea of the API of me, of the growth of personal data stores. Um, regulation obviously has some part to play. So for me, the, the, the jury's out on whether, whether the API of me will materialize as a result of open banking. So. So that's it. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you.